Serotonin influences sleep. Serotonin influences the master clock of the body. Serotonin influences sleep differentially depending on the receptor subtype. And Hello friends, welcome to another episode in my serotonergic series. In this episode, we're going to discuss how serotonin, or we're going to review the research on how serotonin affects sleep and how the reverse is true according to the mechanisms. Now, it, it's not comp the, the results will not be completely clear in terms of the individual receptors, but I'm going to summarize the state of the art understanding of the research. This is, by the way, my third day of recording uh, videos, not in a row, but I've been interrupted by my other work, my strategy consulting work, and also work with clients, so I haven't been able to record these in a row. But uh, I hope today will be the final day of recording, so hopefully we'll get through the remainder of the important associations between serotonin and different facets of our biology. So let's get started with uh, circadian serotonin. First of all, it was originally noted by a researcher who I've mentioned before, Michel Jouvet, hopefully I'm pronouncing his uh, French sounding name correctly, that, um, well, it was or originally thought that serotonin was a modulator of sleep because what was noted was that uh, in rodents who had uh, damage to the RAF nuclei, what would happen is that they would uh, display a phenotype of insomnia. So if the RAF nuclei, which we talked about before, they're the serotonergic nuclei, the ones that actually produce serotonin in the brain. If they're damaged, which means serotonin synthesis is inhibited, then the, the rodents developed um, insomnia. But we know now that melatonin is derived of serotonin, so we, we know this now. But I just wanted you guys to know the history of it. Later, it was shown that uh, the activity of the RAF nuclei is highest during the daytime and lowest during the nighttime. So it has sort of a diurnal activity. Now, if you guys haven't seen my series on sleep, you may not know about this, but there's an area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, shortened with the acronym SCN. The SCN is the body's master clock and it governs most of the circadian rhythms of the body. Now, that's a physical activity, but there are also genes that influence the SCN. So what I wanted to tell you guys is that the SCN in the brain is modulated by serotonin. So its neurons experience a phase shift in activity when serotonin is applied directly to them and when um, when the serotonergic neurons of the RAF nuclei are stimulated. So both in both of those cases. The SCN has a lot of 5-HT1A receptors and 5-HT1B receptors. You guys will remember those are the, some of the most studied receptors and uh, they are also autoreceptors. And it has very few 5-HT1C receptors, 5-HT2 receptors and 5-HT6 receptors in the SCN. The clock genes that modulate the SCN's activity are also modulated by agonism of the 5-HT1A receptor. So you can see this interrelation. Not only does serotonin directly influence the SCN, but even the genes that influence the SCN are affected by the serotonin receptors. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about two kinds of studies. One are knockout studies of rodents. For those of you who haven't seen my other videos, knockout studies of rodents are studies of transgenic no rodents. That means genes are removed from a rodent's uh, biology and then the rodent grows up without that gene or it's removed later in life. So what they've discovered from knockout studies is that, number one, when 5-HT1A receptors and B receptors are knocked out, the same thing happens. REM sleep increases, non-REM sleep stays the same, and wakefulness stays the same. For you guys that haven't seen my series on sleep, sleep is basically a cyclical, uh, in sleep you have a cyclical repetition of going from stages of non-REM sleep to REM sleep, and then back to non-REM sleep, then back to REM sleep, then back to non-REM, and then eventually wake up. These go in cycles of about an hour and a half. The non-REM sleep, Every, I mean, it's, more, it's easier for people to experience. REM sleep really declines when people get older. In non-REM sleep, which is, seems to be more important for physical health, 
what happens is your brain is sort of, your brain has the least activity of your whole lifetime in non-REM sleep. But your body is still quite active. You're fidgety when you're sleeping and so on. In REM sleep, your brain is very active, very similar to when you're awake. And that's, by the way, when you're dreaming. It's also called dream sleep. But your body is sort of paralyzed. Uh, this is thought to be so you don't act, act out your dreams. So the interesting thing is that when you knock out the 5-HT1A receptors and B receptors, REM sleep uh, increases, but non-REM sleep declines and wakefulness declines. On the other hand, when the 5-HT2A receptors and C receptors, either of them, are removed, what ends up happening is that REM sleep stays the same, non-REM sleep stays the same, uh, non-REM sleep, sorry, declines, and wakefulness increases. Differential effects on sleep. The 5-HT7 receptors, when they are uh, deleted, REM sleep declines, again, different from the other two, non-REM sleep stays the same, and wakefulness stays the same. So in the 5-HT1 A, A and B receptors, REM increases. In the 5-HT2 A and C receptors, REM decreases. And in the 5-HT7 uh, uh, receptors, REM decreases also. So they have really differential effects on the impact on sleep depending on the receptors. What this shows is that serotonin does not have uh, the same effect across receptor subtypes, which also shows the potential of differentially agonizing or antagonizing these receptors to alter sleep, which is something that, by the way, researchers have not done and something that could be done in the future to improve the sleep of people. This, these are opportunities for future research, by the way, things that are just left in the research that have not been pursued. So now let's talk about uh, systemic agonism. See, there are two ways that you could deal with these receptors. You could apply a local agonist to the receptors and see how, they, they, uh, how, the, act, uh, how the phenotype develops, or you could uh, deliver a systemic agonist of a certain serotonin receptor into a rodent and then see the results. To simplify things, I'm just going to review the systemic ones here. So in terms of systemic ones, 5-HT1 A and B agonists cause REM sleep to decline, which is, so would make sense because deletion of the gene increases REM sleep. So it causes REM sleep to decline, it causes non-REM sleep to decline, and it causes wakefulness to increase. It, it, antagonism does the opposite for REM sleep. Now, 5-HT2A and C uh, uh, agonists cause rodents REM sleep to decline also, which does, which does not follow, follow through from the knockout studies. It causes non-REM sleep to increase and it causes wakefulness to decline. Then, by the way, I know this is a little detailed and maybe some people will not be so interested in it, but I'm providing the information here for the people that are interested in it because this stuff is very hard to find in the research. So, now, antagonism of the 5-HT2A and C receptors cause REM sleep to decline, non-REM sleep to increase, and wakefulness to decline, which is the opposite of the agonism. Selective uh, 5-HT2C receptor agonism, because, the other, because most of the agonists agonize A and B, but selective 5-HT2C uh, agonism decreases REM, just like the uh, unselective one, it keeps non-REM the same, which is different, and increases wakefulness. And the antagonism also of 5-HT2C that's selective also decreases REM and increases non-REM, which is different. So there's uh, some differential effects we're observing here, which are difficult to explain. In terms of 5-HT7, agonism decreases REM sleep, uh, decreases the number of REM cycles during the sleep, and increases wakefulness. So I reviewed, so here what I did basically was summarized my research into, or my literature review, which was done from originally for a series, but then for my book. I summarized the results of that for you guys as quickly as possible. Clearly, this is not going to be extremely useful to anyone unless they're very interested in sleep or developing pharmacologic tools to improve sleep. But the outcomes here are basically to see that, I'm not finished by the way, but the outcomes are to see that serotonin influences sleep, serotonin influences the master clock of the body, serotonin influences sleep differentially depending on the receptor subtype, and as we'll soon learn, uh, the opposite is also true. So let's look at the rest. So first of all, I want to let you guys know SSRIs reduce REM sleep. And this is un understandable because in REM sleep, your serotonin should be the lowest during the day. 
or at least in, in sleep in general it should be but SSRIs increase serotonergic activity so they decrease REM sleep many drugs decrease REM sleep for example one of the most potent drugs to do this is THC um, but many other drugs do this to be honest though let me tell you it doesn't it doesn't do this nearly as effectively as THC uh, I've taken SSRIs on and off for a number of years and I experienced not only dreaming during sleep but very pleasant dreams whereas when I used THC or some other molecules I had absolutely no dreams in my sleep or I couldn't remember them at the very least at all and uh, this was consistent for a number of years so I think I was actually not dreaming and not entering REM sleep uh, but this is personal anecdotal experience now serotonin this is quite interesting so serotonin levels are very affected by sunlight so they are a person's serotonin levels are higher during a sunny day as opposed to an overcast day they're higher in the summer than in the winter not only that but in people who have a seasonal affective disorder tryptophan depletion which means de de decreasing the, the amount of tryptophan in their diet, which serotonin is made of tryptophan, will depress them more. But this will not happen if they are out in sunlight when the experiment is done. So sunlight really affects serotonin. And one of the ways that uh, seasonal affective disorder may be, uh, the mechanisms that it may be working through is potentially serotonin. So what you know then is because serotonin gets affected by whether you're in the sunlight or not what happens in the sunlight by the way is that the, the light goes into the eye and affects if in the end the SCN the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the brain which is the master regulator of the body's circadian clock so what happens is what we're knowing now is that sunlight is affecting serotonin levels via the suprachiasmatic nucleus I mean we don't know that for sure but most likely in turn, serotonin is modulating the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So basically what we know is that there's a very strong interplay between the body's circadian clocks and serotonin. And serotonin affects the clocks, the clocks affect serotonin, and they're very much involved. So a, dis uh, a disruption in your circadian rhythms may affect your serotonin levels, and your serotonin levels may affect your circadian rhythm. But in terms of the individual receptor effects, that's really probably only useful for someone who is trying to really optimize their sleep and wants to use individual agonists in individually. Anyway, guys, I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you in the next uh, segment.